We are so fortunate to be joined again by Jordan Levine, the Vice President and Chief Economist of the California Association of Realtors. In his role at the California Association of Realtors, Jordan is responsible for housing market and economic research, policy analysis and support of CAR's legislative and government affairs efforts, he graduated from UC Santa Barbara with a bachelor's in economics and has earned his master's degree with merit in international economics from the University of Sussex. Thank you, Jordan, again for being here with us today. Thank you so much, Carla, for having me back. Let me go ahead and share my screen and we can get into this uh, market update. The way that I've been doing it lately is to go through the uh, the kind of negative side first. So I start by throwing the wet blanket over things and warning you against the temptation to throw your business in cruise control. When you look at all of the data, it's relatively positive, um, but there's still a lot of headwinds out there, both in terms of the kind of macroeconomic environment, but in particular, when it comes to us in housing, it's on the supply front, right? We've got lots of buyer demand and good things happening out there. And yet I don't think it's time to uh, look at the last six months worth of double digit growth and think that that will be able to persist and that we can just kick our feet up on the desk, throw it into cruise control and ride that wave and expect that kind of growth to persist through the, the end of 2021. The reason why I start by managing your expectations is because when you look at the actual market data, it's pretty positive, right? We've seen lots of good progress economically uh, in terms of labor markets, in terms of consumer spending, GDP growth, all of the nerdy economic data that, that the economists like me like to go through. Um, when you look at who's buying and selling, that's also encouraging, right? We see a lot of activity in particular from first time home buyers. So that American dream is still alive and well. Uh, and, and we have low rates that are pumping up demand even more than, than normal. And on top of that, we have some really good structural changes that make housing more important to us now than ever before. And so uh, all of the, the kind of trends point to not just uh, more economic growth, but that actually housing will be on the forefront and, and be one of the bright spots of the economy moving forward. I think that it's important to point out that although we have had an unprecedented shock, we have much better fundamentals going into this crisis than we had back in 2008, as an example. And I think that's really important when we think about moving the needle on things like supply, right? You have a lot of folks who maybe don't think it's a good time to sell. And, and so there's you know a, a, what I call a Kool-Aid effect or a brother-in-law effect where the conventional wisdom or maybe somebody told you that it's not a good time to sell your home, that recessions mean that home prices fall and things like that. And so I think that it's incumbent on us to, uh, again, not throw our business in cruise control to keep our uh, foot on the accelerator or keep our nose to the grindstone or uh, keep hustling or whatever your favorite analogy is there uh, to to kind of put the data in front of those sellers noses and realize that it it is a pretty good time to, to sell. Um, and, and at the same time, kind of, again, warning you that even though this isn't 2008 all over again, that, that we do wanna put in that elbow grease to, to get that supply online in particular. I will leave you with the forecast, which the moral of the story there is that we're more optimistic than we were even back in October when I presented our forecast with the former chief economist, Leslie Appleton Young at our reimagined conference. We see more growth in sales coming down the pike and more growth in home prices in 2021. Again, because we see the economy getting better and that demand for housing is there coupled with really low mortgage interest rates. So let's uh, get into the nerdy economic stuff that really sets the context through which the housing market operates. And there you can see that the news is fairly positive here in California after peaking at almost 16 and a half percent unemployment back in April. We have made consistent and substantial progress. In fact, through the end of November, when I'm uh, 
looking at the data, we've cut that number more than in half. We're not quite as low as what you see in the rest of the United States, but we have made substantial progress there nonetheless. And this is important, right? When the labor markets are doing well, when folks are working, when they're earning income, they're able to make housing decisions like moving from rental to ownership, from moving to my from my small house to my big house, or maybe uh, selling my big house and downsizing into something that works better for me now that my kids are out of the house, what have you. That is all predicated on a strong economy where I'm working and making money. And the good news there is, again, things have moved significantly in the right direction as we head into 2021. When you look at uh, mortgage rates, again, they're at historically low levels. So 2.6, 2.7%. You contrast that with the kind of mortgage rate my dad had when I was a kid back in the 80s, and he would always brag about his 12.5% mortgage rate that he got on his house out in East County, uh, San Diego, at a time when all of his buddies who had bought in uh, La Mesa and what have you were paying 15 16% mortgage rates. And so I think from that perspective, even if we see rates go from uh, down to 2.6, up to 2.8, something like that, we're forecasting that rates will stay at or below 3% through the majority of the year, I think that that all adds up to a tailwind for housing, right? We have the structural change that brought this crisis or that this crisis brought about, right? Where our homes are more important to us than ever before. And we have these all-time low levels of interest rates, which should continue to propel buyer demand this this year. Indeed, when you look at the mortgage applications right through the end of December, you could see that we're still running at a double digit pace ahead of 2019 levels. And so this improving economy, these low rates have really translated into honest to goodness demand for homes. And you see that as folks are filling out these mortgage applications. You see it when you drill into the housing data itself, right? And you look at our numbers for San Diego County in November, and we're about to put out our December numbers, and spoiler alert there, that things continue to grow by a double-digit pace. But you can see that home sales were up by 23% countywide, uh, and even as home prices were rising by double digits. So San Diego County now has a a median price, right? The price at which 50% of the homes sell below that price point, but 50% actually sell above that price point of uh, $740,000 thousand dollars and so you can see that there's insatiable almost demand right the median time on market that's the time it takes to go from list to pending is now one week right you see that that there's no discounting to speak of the median closed sale is closing at a hundred percent of list price and so if the price property is priced correctly it's selling quickly and there's no discounting to to speak of the big challenge though that we have and you can see here on the active listing side is that listings are down almost 50 percent from where they were at the end of 2019 and so you can't continue to sell 2200 homes a month if there's only 700 homes uh, actually out there in san diego county for sale. But again, just a testament to how strong this buyer demand actually is. And it's largely attributable to the fact that after suffering one of the you know most unprecedented shocks economically, that we've had six to eight months of ongoing economic progress coupled with very, very low mortgage interest rates. What about who's buying, right? Is it all investors? Well, no. In fact, if you look at our annual housing market survey, which we did in 2020 for the Uh, I think 35th or 36th consecutive year, you can see that we've actually had the uh, largest number of first-time home buyers, the largest percentage of the market going to first-time home buyers that we've seen in a decade. And this is, again, a testament to just how low rates really make a difference for purchasing power. And again, the structural shift brought on by the pandemic, where again, our house is more important to us than ever before. It's not just where we go home and eat and you know lay down for the night before we head off to work the next day. We live there, uh, we play there, we're held hostage there for months on end, right? And so um, we also have more need for space. And so again, all of these things have uh, really moved the needle in terms of getting folks to put their foot on the property ladder for the first time. 
one of the interesting things is when you look at who is, who those first time buyers are, at least economically, what you can see is that they tend to be relatively affluent. And this is symptomatic of this kind of two pronged impact of the current crisis for folks who, uh, you know, are data nerds like me who can do their jobs remotely and work on a spreadsheet and a laptop. Uh, we've been relatively unimpacted economically, we continue to earn income and, and have those jobs. And in some cases, have even downsized a lot of our expenses because we're no longer uh, commuting back and forth and and outlaying on transportation and fuel and all of that kind of stuff. Uh, and so what you see is that although we saw a lot of first time buyers, they tend to be in that kind of upper income, more affluent category with more than a third actually putting down at least 20%. And that's a far cry from where we've been in years uh, past. What about this idea of giving up on the cities, right? So we do a weekly survey of realtors. And over the last couple of months, we've been asking, where have your uh, sellers actually gone when they sold that property? Where was their next property? And although you see that, yes, uh, we have seen about 30%, 31% of realtors have worked with a seller who left California completely. And that's the downside of this increased flexibility. But it's also an opportunity for places like San Diego, right? Because you do have folks who are uh, maybe sick of the political climate, struggling with affordability, struggling with being able to find a home that they really like, that are going to opt to maybe move to Idaho, to Arizona. And we did see an uptick in out migration this year. Year. But the flip side of that is that San Diego is still a high quality of life place that is much more affordable than other parts of California. And so even as we may lose folks to other states, I think that folks who are living in San Francisco that no longer have to go to office jobs there every day, uh, where you know a two bedroom condo costs $1.7 million, might look to a place like Rancho Santa Fe or La Jolla. And so we expect the top end to continue to do well, but we still expect San San Diego County overall to, to grow. Uh, and you can see that when we talk to our members, almost two thirds either uh, moved to another home in the same exact city, stayed within the county where they already lived or moved to some other part of California. And so yes, flexibility means that more people might leave California to other states. But what you also see is that folks are still really putting down roots in California too. You see the resort markets in particular doing really well, right? So this is that uh, symptom of increased flexibility. A lot of first time home buyers maybe buy a cabin in Big Bear, go move to Lake Tahoe or Mammoth or what have you because they can do those jobs remotely. But what we also see is that the cities are still doing well. And if you zoom into San Diego County, you can see that yes, we're not up 50% in the city of San Diego, the way that we saw in Big Bear, but we're still up by 15%. Oceanside was up by almost 17%. La Mesa was up by 50% relative to where it was in 2019. Chula Vista is the one large city where we're not seeing that growth. And that is the area where there is the biggest decline in active listings. And so again, we might see more out migration. We might see those resort markets do particularly well. But what we also see is that people are putting down roots right there in our urban cores, in our uh, you know largest cities as well. And so I haven't given given up, excuse me, on, on the cities. That being said, again, I want to warn you against the temptation of throwing it in autopilot or, or popping the champagne and pouring yourself a nice mimosa and throwing your business in cruise control because, you know, we've still got a long way to go on the public health crisis. And that means that we still have uh, more economic challenges, right? We'll have to continue to clamp down until we can get to the other side of, you know, broadly distributed uh, vaccines, right? And so there's still a long way to go from an economic standpoint. We've also seen the pace of that recovery really start to peter out. So we just got the December job growth number and we actually lost jobs as the economy had to clamp back down. And that is why we underscore the public health crisis, right? Is because until we can get back to more normalized economic activity, we're still almost 10 million jobs short of where we were at the beginning of this crisis. Of course, here in California, we still have almost 2.7 million people on the government payroll still 
still a lot of financial distress out there. And of course, for me, the biggest issue is that we don't have the inventory, right? We have lots of buyers who want to buy. The American dream is alive and well. We have under 3% mortgage interest rates, but you can't put buyers into homes that aren't for sale. And so I advise you to take that data-driven approach with your sellers and get them to realize that uh, that conventional wisdom doesn't hold true. Homes are selling quick, prices are rising, and there's virtually no uh, haggling that you have to do when the property is priced correctly. And so I think the the moral of the story is to be optimistic, but not overconfident. If you look at our forecast for 2021, we expect sales will continue to go up, maybe a 425,000 unit pace in 2021 with an annual median price of almost 700,000, which would be an increase of about 4.4% from where they were uh, the year before. Part of that is downward skewed because we expect the top end, which has been dominating, to take a little bit of a backseat as more of those owner occupants get in the market, but still robust growth, none nonetheless. And so I think for me, the moral of the story is that yes, the housing market is still doing unseasonably well. Uh, no, you don't want to throw it in cruise control because some of those broader uh, macro indicators show that we still got a lot of healing left to do. And so for me, I think that you just want to make sure you don't throw your business in cruise control, continue to hustle and work really hard and get really serious about supply. And so with that, I will say thank you so much. And if there's, uh, I'll encourage you to take our survey at car.org slash survey, and I'm happy to entertain any questions that you might have. Thanks so much. Great, Jordan. Thanks for that information. I am grateful to hear that you have such optimistic views as it relates to the economic outlook and certainty of our market, because right now it's just kind of all over the place. I suppose it's no surprise that the housing supply continues to be such a defining issue for our industry. We know in San Diego it is critical right now. I know we don't have much time, but I would like to get a couple of questions in from our brokers. With that being said, if you have a question, I'll call upon you and turn on your video. I see a question from Mike Seppeding. Mike, go ahead. Thank you very much, Jordan, for being with us. I really appreciate it. My name is Mike Seppeding, broker owner of REMAX Connections. Conventional wisdom is typically to avoid trying to sell a home during a crisis, but this doesn't seem to be the case during COVID as home prices reached records high last year. What would you say to homeowners who are hesitant to put their home on the market during this pandemic? Also, do you see a demand favoring a particular price point and or region such as larger homes in the suburbs? Thanks, Mike. I, I think that's a great question. I think that that's an area actually where I'm optimistic that we can actually make a difference, right? I think that, uh, as I mentioned, when you look at the actual data, it flies in the face of what I would call the, the brother-in-law effect or the conventional wisdom that recessions are bad times to sell homes. And what I would do is I'd go to car.org, print out our market overview report for whatever city that seller lives in and show them how quickly homes are selling, show them how fast prices are rising show them what other sellers are doing in terms of haggling, that there's virtually no uh, discounting to, to speak of. I think that uh, the, the amount of demand is almost insatiable. And I think that um, you know, when you think about how that shakes out across the, the region, yes, I think places like East County and like Alpine, where I grew up, right, in Lakeside, uh, where you can have big, you know, single level, big lot homes will be more popular now that folks don't have to go downtown. But I think we're still going to see uh, you know, growth in the urban cores as well. And I think, you know, when you go back and look at those market overview reports that I showed you in the presentation, we were still seeing robust growth in the city of San Diego and Oceanside, um, you know, and so in La Mesa, which is not as far east as where I grew up. But uh, again, I think that uh, we might see oversized growth in those kind of higher quality of life markets where people can have more space and more land and a bigger home, and maybe where prices are, are cheaper than they are in in um, you know, La Jolla or Rancho Santa Fe or something like that. But, but again, I still think that we're gonna see good growth across the county next year. I see a question from my friend, Richard Woods. Richard, go ahead. Hello, Jordan. Thank you for the presentation. My name is Richard Woods, broker owner of Woods Real Estate Services and also with the Metro Caravan. My question is related to the rental evictions moratorium. As the state legislature continues to look at the proposals to extend the rental evictions moratorium, many are worried about a looming foreclosure crisis. 
Do you see this taking place? And if so, how will this impact our local market? I'm glad you asked about foreclosures as well. This is an area that I just touched on briefly in my prepared remarks, but which I think is absolutely critical to underscore that the fundamentals coming into this crisis were much different than 2008 when we had a big foreclosure crisis. It's not to say that we uh, won't experience some foreclosures this time around, but when you look at the structure of the mortgage market, uh, underwriting was very, very tight. Instead of having half the mortgages originated this time being 5-1 option arms where people's loans could reset and their payments could go up significantly overnight uh, instead of having a ton of cash out refining and HELOCing, right, where we used our home as our bank account and took everybody to Europe or bought a boat or went on a cruise or what have you. That was just not a phenomenon this time around. We had just a fraction of the home equity extraction, uh, not half the market 5-1 option arms, like 10 to 15% over the last decade. And we've had to underwrite these mortgages at very high standards in terms of incomes, FICO scores and down payments, right? And so that doesn't, again, mean that it, it inoculates us from the effects of this crisis, but we don't have all of those fundamental imbalances bubbling under the surface that we had back in 2000 six, seven, and eight, that once we had an economic shock with the crash of Bear Stearns, Lehman Brothers, when prices started to fall, it started this snowball or cascade effect because we had all these deeper fundamental flaws. And so uh, again, we expect to see some foreclosures. Some folks aren't going to be able to hold on to their homes during this crisis, but folks have home equity this time, right? We have a market where prices are going up by double digits and we have buyers lined up around the proverbial block uh, for each home that hits the market. And so uh, we know that folks don't foreclose on or walk away from a home you have home equity in, you sell it, right? And so uh, we expect that foreclosures are gonna be less than 10% of the market. Um, and even in our absolute worst case scenario, which we don't think is very likely. Actually, I stopped presenting our for our worst case scenario forecast, but even in that scenario, we were talking about a foreclosure crisis that was less than half as bad as what we saw back in 2008. Hi, Emma, how you doing? Emma Lefowitz. Hi, Jordan. Thank you so much for your great presentation and for being here today with us. My name is Emma Lefkowitz of the Barron Team at Compass, and I also represent the Scripps Ranch Caravan. My question for you today is about Prop 19. Um, since it recently passed, we do have a lot of um, original owners in Scripps Ranch in the 1970s and 1980s homes, and we're curious what impact you see Prop 19 will have on the region, um, specifically if you think we'll see an increase in single-family homes um, and possibly investment properties coming onto the market. Great question on Prop 19. Again, I, I see that as another uh, opportunity. I think that, you know, for for even on the inheritance side, right? The, for the folks who want to keep those homes as, as family homes or whatever, there's absolutely no impact. If you're using it as a vacation or a second home, we might actually see some of those homes hit the market for folks who don't want to eat the property tax increase, um, but, but I, which I think will be a positive, right? Because I talked about the fundamental challenge for the market this year being a lack of supply. And so seeing some of those rental properties come up for ownership housing uh, as some of those heirs um, decide to just pocket the money and not deal with uh, being a property manager at these higher tax rates, then I think that could be just what the doctor ordered. On the uh, ownership side, I'm more encouraged, right? Or on the, on the tax portability side of that, proposition, I'm even more encouraged, right? Because I think that that is the housing stock where folks have been uh, facing a potential tax penalty if they wanted to downsize and free up those uh, single family homes. And now they don't face that tax penalty. And so A, they'll be encouraged to want to sell that home. But B, more importantly, I'm hoping that what it will do is encourage builders to develop new uh, communities like single family um, resort style communities that these long term homeowners want to actually move into and, and again get that whole uh, freezing of the supply chain unlocked to really start to fundamentally tackle what I think is not just San Diego's but California's key challenge of not building enough housing to enable home ownership in the American dream for enough people. Again, thank you, Jordan, for joining us today. Thank you guys so much for having me again. I, I always enjoy the chance to, uh, to talk about my hometown, San Diego. So uh, I look forward to seeing you on the next one.